Okay, I hope I'm able to connect now. I don't know what just happened. Hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm waiting for my guest. Okay, not just clumsy, just joined. Let me see. Can you request to join, Alicia? View request. Here we go. All right. Okay, I'm waiting for Alicia to join. Hi, Alicia. How are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for finding the time to meet. This is so exciting. Yes, I'm really excited. Oh, thank you excellent. so much for having me. Excellent. Okay, well, why don't we get started? So I am going to introduce myself and, and you as well. I am Dr. Lauren. And sorry. This, this is... Um, Think Dyslexia, and so I am a special educator. I've been a special educator for about a decade, and um, I have worked in the dyslexia community for quite some time, and um, I've worked in the elementary and secondary um, environment over the past few years, too. So I'm really excited to hear more about dyspraxia because I know most of what I usually do my lives are about dyslexia and actually to just in full disclosure I was actually in a meeting with my principal the other day and we were talking about a student that was looking at the school where I teach and um, they had a dyspraxia uh, diagnosis and so she looked at me and she was like well what are, you know Dr. Rosenstein what do you think and I was like you know I really don't know much about dyspraxia I really would like to learn more and I know that you have this account so I'm really excited to hear from you so our audience today uh, this is Alicia Bircher. I said your name correctly, right? Yes, you did. Thank you. Uh-huh. And she's an adult with dyslexia and dyspraxia, and she was recently diagnosed with autism. She also holds a master's in secondary teaching and works as a learning enrichment teacher in New South Wales in Australia. Uh, she has also been an educator for about six years and has taught in the rural and low socioeconomic areas. And she primarily focuses on the grades seven through 10 and works, um, as I said before, as a learning enrichment teacher. So the way I want to kind of structure this conversation is there are four main questions that I want our audience to kind of like pinpoint in and listen to. So the first question is really like, what's your perspective as an adult and an educator with dyspraxia? And what can you offer as some kind of pointers and signs to identify for parents and educators? So that's our first question. Our second one is really what does special education look like in Australia and are teachers well versed in understanding what dyspraxia looks like? And the third one is as an educator with autism and dyspraxia, how do you feel this impacts your teaching in positive ways? And then the last question is what tips can you offer for educators and parents? So to just get started, the first question I will ask again for our audience and for you. So as an adult and an educator with dyspraxia, how can you explain what dyspraxia is and how can educators and parents identify signs in their children or students? Alrighty, so dyspraxia is actually quite a loaded term. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit later, but simply put, dyspraxia refers to difficulties with movement. So that includes challenges with fine motor skills, like drawing or writing, gross motor skills, so they're your big movements like catching or kicking a ball, motor planning, which is organising all the little pieces that make up a larger movement, and coordination. Okay. So, yeah, so it's actually not a new term. It's been around for decades, but it's really important to note that in many countries the term is actually being phased out. Interesting. Yeah, and um, that's creating... A buzz. couple of issues, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and the reason why it's being phased out is because dyspraxia doesn't have a set definition and it isn't internationally recognised as an official diagnosis. Right, okay. Yeah. So, um, in the UK, dyspraxia is often used as like an umbrella term to describe other difficulties beyond motor skills, like 
also including things like speech, um, problems with social skills, and particularly attention. Uh, it's really important to note that a lot of people with ADHD, 50% of people with ADHD, actually meet the diagnostic criteria for DCD, which is the formal diagnosis. Interesting. Yeah. Um, developmental coordination disorder is the official diagnosis for motor skills challenges. Okay. And how we see that in kids are problems with posture, motor learning, and sensory motor coordination. Okay. So that's um, everything that we do is kind of influenced by sensory input. Yes. And for dyspraxic children and adults, that's somewhat impaired. So it's a very common and lifelong neurodevelopmental disorder, and it actually affects around 5% of people. Wow. Yeah. So that means that in a normal mainstream classroom, you have at least one dyspraxic child, and it's quite likely that that child is undiagnosed and therefore unsupported. So um, it's also important to know that Dyspraxia, DCD, is not the same in all people. Some people may only have problems with their fine motor skills, mm. like drawing, writing. Uh, some might have trouble with their gross motor skills, like playing certain sports, Speaking dancing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And some kids kind of have a combination of both. It also co-occurs with other forms of neurodiversity, especially ADHD, as I mentioned before, and dyslexia. It's really uncommon for kids with DCD or dyspraxia not to have another condition. Um, and I know we were talking earlier about um, some kids having problems with speech. Yes. Um, so some children with DCD have problems coordinating the movements required to produce clear speech. So you may have heard some professionals use the term verbal dyspraxia. Mm, okay. um, so um, speech language pathologists actually use the term CAS, which I'm sure you would have heard before. Um, that um, is childhood apraxia of speech. So they're basically the, the same thing. Um, and in the DSM-5, um, it's verbal dyspraxia is another name for speech sound disorder. Oh, wow. I'm seriously learning so much right now. <laughs> Sorry. I feel like I've overloaded you. Um, this is so, this is so much uh, amazing information and I might follow up. I will follow up actually with some follow-up questions. Cause like I'm learning, this is great. <laughs> That's awesome. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, signs in children and your students. So when we're talking about children, let's go to infants. So really big one um, are delays in reaching important developmental milestones. Right, right. So that's, that's the biggest one. My younger sister began to walk before me and that's when people realised something was wrong. Um, so these children might take longer than expected to crawl or walk. They may also have problems sitting up on their own and that's due to a weak muscle tone. Right. Uh, and they also might have some unusual body positions and postures during that first year. Okay. Um, these kids also have problems playing with toys that require good coordination, like stacking blocks on top of each other. Okay. Um, they can also be quite messy eaters, like missing their mouth with cutlery, like more so than their neurotypical peers. Yeah. Okay. Um, for our older kids, so our elementary or primary kids, um, they're kids who have problems with hopping, jumping, running, catching a ball, kicking a ball. And these kids over time actually avoid joining in with their peers because they are acutely yeah. aware. Yeah they, yeah, they know that they're not performing as well as their peers. Sure. Um, that said, there are kids with DCD who are very, very sporty and their problems are only fine motor. Um, some of these kids have problems walking up and down stairs. So um, I've seen a kid do this and I used to do it. So I used to go one step at a time. So one foot down, next foot, 
one foot down, next foot. And it took double the time. Um, I didn't I just fully learn how. I have to cause it reminds me. So I have a three year old. Um, I have yes. two daughters, but my youngest is three. And when we do her developmental questions, some of them as a special educator, I don't get. That's actually one of the questions. It's like, do you oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it's like, do, do, does your child walk? And they have a visual too. Like, do they yes. do that, or is it, you know? And I and I don't want to use the word normal because I know that that's not that's not a comfortable term for some. Well, we could use typical. Typical, right? And so, yes. but, but this is really. I'm thinking as a special educator about all the students that I've worked with over the last 10 years. And I'm like, wow, I can really kind of see some of that social, I can see how some of this can impact social things. And Oh, it is huge. Yeah. But I mean, I'm just like, cause you, cause you really are giving me and the audience so much great information. And I'm like, wow, this is so much uh, like in a, in a good way, in a good way. But I mean, like, I'm trying to like, process all this and I'm like this like the verbal part like it's it's really fascinating I do want to ask a clarifying question so is it is it, it you said DCD yes is that in the DSM-5 yes it is so it's not considered dyspraxia as a diagnosis or no so where did so you... um um so dyspraxia has been around I think since the um 70s Okay. And it was replaced in 1989. Okay. Um, so a group of people all came together to discuss the terminology um, because the word dyspraxia isn't just a neurodevelopmental disorder. People in medical fields use it to refer to problems that people may experience after a stroke. And it was causing a lot of confusion. And... It's, it's quite difficult because myself included, they're very attached to being dyspraxic. And so it's, it is creating confusion. a lot of confusion and difficulties. And um, a lot of people aren't happy with the term DCD because they feel it doesn't properly give you a picture of the whole thing. Right. I mean, just yeah, just it's very convoluted. <laughs> yeah. So, I want to ask you this because I know mm -hmm. that I, I just, I want to make sure our audience is getting good information, but I also want to make sure where maybe, maybe we could do another live too, but I like more on the details of this, but I want to actually delve in. What does the special education plats like landscape look like in Australia or more specifically in your, um, do you call them provinces, um, provinces? So are we have states? Um, state, state education. States? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I was trying to think of what, what they were called in Australia. So what does that look like in, in New South Wales? I mean, is special education progressive? Is it, I mean, do the educators know what dyspraxia is? Do they know how to accommodate and support? I mean. I think there's some pretty exciting stuff going on with special education in Australia and in New South Wales. There's a lot of fantastic research going on. And teachers seem to be more aware of different forms of learning disorders and neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, but in terms of dyspraxia, it seems as if it's non-existent. Okay. Um, so I'm always very vocal about having dyspraxia. I, like in job interviews, I just tell them. Yeah. Um, and I talk to other teachers about it. Um, but my... In my past schools, no one really knew what it was and uh, the kids weren't very well supported with it. Um, but in my current job, because my poor co-workers hear me talk about it all the time, um, all of the teachers have a really wonderful set of tricks that they can use to support our dyspraxic students. So I feel things in my current school are fantastic but um it sort of differs school to school unfortunately and also depending on the funding that that school receives and the area that it's in sure and i think it's probably very similar here in the united states i mm. feel like i've been in private and public for the last 10 years i feel like i've heard the term dyspraxia but i could not 
firmly state as a special educator, like, yeah, let me give you this quick elevator speech on what this is, because I didn't mm -hmm. really know. And I think, you know, me being very adventurous and, you know, really wanting to understand and perspective take, I was like, I really need to do more research on this, because I do feel like there are some teachers that get further in their career. And they're like, this is how I've always done it. Oh, this, yeah. is like, this, this, I don't need to explore. I don't need to do this. And like, for me, I'm like, but everything is always evolving and changing. And there, there's new research, there's new data. And I felt for me, it was really because I know I've, I've been following your account for quite some time. And yes, so you were one of my first followers. <laughs> I'm so glad because I literally was like, wow, I don't know much about this. And when it came up recently in conversation, like I said, with my principal, I was like, you know what, I know the perfect person to inquire. And obviously, here we are now. So I think um, it's really um, nice, but not good. And it's like pros and cons to hear that Australia is kind of in the same place in some ways as the United States, where it's like, there is some progressive areas and I'm sure there's some hot spot like buzzword disabilities there where you're like oh yeah every teacher knows and mm. understands that maybe autism is one I know here autism is, is huge where it's like yes anything autism it's like gotta get them diagnosed here are the supports you know that kind of mm. thing. get an IEP but I feel like with dyspraxia I would be really surprised to um, hear if there were a lot of especially public school teachers knowing what that means yeah, um, and there's also, sorry to interrupt, no, no, there's no. also this really pervasive idea among pediatricians and other healthcare providers that it is something that can be grown out of. And it's, it's essential that kids receive early intervention yes. for it. It can significantly impact Your life, people's yeah. lives. Yeah, yeah, it's just like with dyslexia. I, I Absolutely you know, the earlier, the better. And I'm learning right now with you in this conversation, it's the same thing with dyspraxia. So being an adult with dyspraxia, how do you feel like you can connect with your students? I know you said there's probably one, I can't remember what the number you said, but at least one student in a class that could have it undiagnosed. How do you feel as an educator you're able to support given your own life experiences? So I feel that um, my dyspraxia is essential to my job. So I teach a lot of neurodiverse students. Um, some have ADHD, some have dyslexia, some have autism, some are undiagnosed dyspraxics, um, some have a combination. And I feel that it's given me a wonderful insight into the school system and how some kids can be left behind. It's given me wonderful empathy and it's forced me to develop strategies to support myself. So when I was at school, I wasn't disabled enough to receive, to receive any support. Um, and so I had to develop strategies for myself to um, cope. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah. So I try to teach those strategies to my kids. Like, look, we need to break everything up into smaller tasks. We need to ask for help if there's lots of writing from the board and try to get them to be a little bit more, um, like find their own voice and advocate for themselves, but also um, find a way to make things work for them. Sure. And I see um, Orton Gillingham Nation, which is a colleague and friend of mine. I did a live with her a while ago. She just said mirrors are important. What a powerful role model you must be. And I 100% agree with that. And I think given where the direction of is going, and I'm so sorry, my timer keeps going off. <laughs> I hope that's no, not that's okay. In the live. <laughs> Okay. Um, you know, it's really important for us in this country too, and obviously globally, but for what's given the climate of our country to kind of have these young girls of color to see role models in these big figures and these big positions. And so I think for our students in our classrooms, it's really important for kids to see, oh, my teacher is saying she's dyspraxic. My teacher is saying she struggles with this because it normalizes it for them. And I think. Oh, that, absolutely. Yes. And so I think that that is really probably one of the biggest gifts that you can offer 
is telling the kids like, you know, at the end of the day, we want kids to learn academics, but really school is, is bigger than just academics. You know, it's about how do you survive in life and interact with people and social skills and those kinds of things. So I think it's really fantastic that you are a mirror to kids that can see like, hey, you know what? I have dyspraxia too. And I have autism as well. And she's successful. I can do that as well. So I think that's great. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely. So, I, so I'm, I'm looking at the time, and I want to keep this kind of close to 20 minutes as possible, but I feel that this could obviously be a part two. But I think... To, oh, uh, yes. Yes, definitely. Um, but I think to conclude tonight, I'm hoping that you could give maybe three to five uh, tips maybe to, to give parents and or educators to how to best support their, their child or student? You know, what are some big things that like they can take away and say, oh, wow, I didn't realize I was doing this. Maybe I should be doing that. <laughs> All righty. So um, I'll just start with practical tasks at school. Okay. So things like PDH, PE, like sport, cooking classes, mm -hmm. science lessons that have a practical component. It's really, really important to provide us with explicit instructions on how to carry out that task. Okay. You can't expect us to just see it once and remember how to do it. Mm. So in cooking, for instance, it would be really amazing if you could provide us with a visual organiser of what yes. to do. Yes, yes. Um, I've actually made these little laminated sort of steps and attached them with a keychain and they have each step and you just turn them. And then that. that way you're not getting overwhelmed by all the steps. You just focus on that one thing one at a time. Yes. And that could be for a science lesson or a cooking lesson. Yes. For sport, it's really essential that the focus isn't always on team sports or competing. It's just going to create more avoidance behaviours. Yes. It's going to impact kids' self-worth. We need to compete with ourselves. We also need the opportunity to practice the little tiny movements that all make up a big movement. Fine motor. Um, well, not just the fine motor, but um, like even something like kicking a football okay. or, um, for example, um, we're not very good at transferring one skill to another. So, for instance, we could hit a tennis ball with a racket and we've practiced that and we're really good at that and then we go to hit a baseball with a baseball bat and we can't do it. I see. We can't transfer it. I see. We need to be explicitly taught how to do it in each yes. situation. Yes. And with that, we need a lot of patience and a lot of time. Time, yes. Yes. <laughs> this is making so much sense now hearing this from this perspective. <laughs> yes. And it's, it's not like we don't want to do it. We're not lazy and we're not disinterested. We do want to be involved with our peers. We want to learn. But it just, yeah, someone's just commented, team sports ruined my self-esteem. I it saw just, that. I saw it's that. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so doing something individually and competing with yourself is so important, like weightlifting, other skills-based things like maybe a, a circuit, something like that, something you can do on your own is incredible. Um, with regards to handwriting, this is a really big one. Um, younger learners really need a lot of practice. Please just don't give them an iPad and their finger. Please give them like a large crayon, yeah. big markers, and build it up, large pens, large pencils, even like pen pencil grips really help quite a lot. Um, having desks that are at an angle really help too because we have poor core strength and having it on an angle, having our work on an angle really does help. Grid paper to write on is really helpful too because it helps us with uh, um, spacing and our letter formation. Um, and then also using like a multi-sensory approach, like yeah. using Play-Doh to mould letters or writing with like shaving cream and stuff like that is really helpful too for getting those shapes. 
Um, and then older learners might actually benefit from assistive technology, mm -hmm. like using voice to text. Yes. Um, they, like a scribe for exams is also really, really helpful. And even um, getting kids to respond in an alternate way, like making a video instead of writing an essay. Those are great tips. I'm actually going to uh, message you after this and ask if I can get those. So maybe we can do a, a joint oh, absolutely. Post together because I think there are a lot of things that I'm thinking through the special education lens of things that I would automatically kind of do anyway, but I know yes. not everyone thinks that, which is why I, I wanted to ask you that question about some tips. So this has been incredibly educational and powerful and I am so grateful that we could find this time I know I don't know if the audience knows we are 16 hours apart <laughs> so it is 8 p.m here on the east coast of the United States and you are in New South Wales and it's 12 30 <laughs> in the yes. morning and, and it's about afternoon. 38 degrees Celsius it's so hot <laughs> oh right because you're yes yes <laughs> it's summertime for you right yes Right. So that is, that's amazing. So I don't know the temperature here right now. I think it's maybe 40 something, but we're in Fahrenheit. So I don't know what that would be Celsius, but it's chilly here and it's January. And I think there were some snow flurries the other day. But, oh, fantastic. Um, yes. But anyway, I am really excited about this live and um, I, this, this will be, um, you know, on my page for everyone to view at their leisure and I'm going to put this on my YouTube channel. So thank you so much, Alicia, for your expertise and your, um, your time. And I would love to do a follow up, uh, you know, another live with you because I think this is just like a part one, two, three and four. <laughs> Yeah, sorry for me info dumping on you. <laughs> no, I think that this is what people need to hear. And I think that this is something that needs to be discussed, which is why I am always trying to advocate to get the good word out there because this is important information and you brought a lot of um, knowledge into my world tonight. So I, I greatly appreciate that. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. <laughs> Oh, yes. Thank you. And you too. Thank you for giving me this platform Absolutely. and for uh, making dyspraxia a little bit more well known. So it's been wonderful talking with you. Absolutely. And we will be in touch. And to everyone else who joined, thank you so much. And share this video with everybody, please. <laughs> okay. I'll talk to you All soon. All right. Bye. Bye.